the first thing I must do is to check. Can you hear me? Yes. Is that working? Yes. Great. That's that's terrific. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I wish you all a very uh, uh, happy new year. Ni hao, gung ju wei. Excuse me. Sin chun kua kuai la. I think that's right. Close to being describable. Um, it's, I'm very glad indeed to uh, have the opportunity to uh, open this um, series of talks. Um, the Chinese garden has been a great interest of mine for a long time, but it, it is very different from other gardens. Could I have the... Uh, the, um, the Chinese garden is a result of Chinese attitudes to the relations between humans and people, between humans and nature. And that's quite different from Western attitudes and the most basic thing to be remembered. There is no creator god myth in Chinese culture. And most of, the, of what has now come down has been derived in one way or another uh, until very recently from the uh, uh, culture and the history and the legends of the great dynasties, the great uh, dynasties going back to at least 2000 BC. Uh, for example, much of what is now Chinese culture and has been for many years has been derived from the Book of Songs, which is the world's first anthology. It was the first uh, one put together, said to be by Confucius, but probably by other people, in about the 6th or the 5th century uh, BC. So this is very different from the background uh, to, to our culture, and in particular to the relations between humans and, and what they can do and what they do do with nature. The environments of early Chinese cultures were, were generally quite favourable to, um, to human development. It wasn't a Garden of Eden, uh, but it, um, it had many, many assets, which I shall come to. It was rich in, in flora, flowers and plants and fauna, very settled patterns of the seasons, grand scenery, and the sort of water regulation which was necessary in Mesopotamia and Egypt and the other and the other old civilizations was not necessary. The um, early religions were animistic and polytheistic and very importantly man was a part of nature not a dominant part of nature, a part of nature who hoped for immortality and it's interesting that in the Chinese tradition immortality is not the immortality that we think of but two or three hundred years, perhaps, you know, that was quite a, quite a good way to go. So, it had richly diverse environments. There were very important, uh, great importance of mountains, which later were used, were symbolized by rocks in gardens. There were great rivers, there were wonderful plants, many of the most famous plants now in the Western garden traditions came from China and Tibet. Uh, there are many different climates and there were strongly marked seasons. This is a, a picture in South China showing, it doesn't come up so well, but you can see the mountains and the mists behind here and the broad, um, broad boats. This is the Yangtze, one of the Yangtze bends, which showing the very dramatic scenery which people grew up amongst. So naturally, when they came to make gardens, all this influenced them. This is a, a map of China, and most of the population of China, with the exception of some over here, is below the 1,500 meter contour, meter, uh, foot contour, 500 meter contour. Uh, about, um, I think, 75% of the population lives in these areas, which are nevertheless very much marked by mountains and by very attractive environments. And, and the Chinese people have been living, or many of them have been living in these very important areas for a long time. This is Neolithic China, the areas where the early civilization, where the civilization gradually developed 
along the Yellow River and at the bottom of the, in the bends of the Yangtze River. And those civilizations go back 10 or 15,000 years at least. It could be much longer. And it was there that the later major empires developed. When we come to look at the garden, it's just well to keep in mind that it's been said that there are only two basically kinds of gardens. Those that are based upon the rectangle or upon angles and those that are based upon curves. Now western gardens until the last couple of hundred years have been based upon rectangles which derives from the, Europe, from the Mesopotamian and Egyptian uh, necessity to develop water resources and which were then pumped according along straight lines. That's the way you did it. And so the gardens were built around that. If you look at the old Egyptian gardens or Mesopotamian gardens, that's the way they were. The, those based on curves are the most important are the Chinese. And the Chinese are naturalistic. That is to say, as we shall see in more detail, they have been developed in order to simulate nature. And I just want to give a, an example, a rather dramatic example of the difference between these. Perhaps the greatest garden that was ever built in China was the Yuan Ming Wen uh, in the northeast suburbs of what is now Beijing. Um, it was developed by the two Qing emperors, Kung Si and Chen Long, and um, over quite a substantial period, and was uh, regarded as the greatest garden ever, ever built in China. Um, it was the king's palace. That's a very important point. It was the king's palace, but in Chinese gardens there is no such thing as a house and a garden. The house and the garden are all one. So the, the em emperor's palace was in fact the collection of buildings within that area. Now it was built a little, la la little uh, later than the palace and gardens of Versailles by the Sun King, the, the great um, uh, Louis XIV of France uh, in outside Paris. And first I'll show you a picture of Versailles, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which I think comes from the 18th century. It, it, the development was started in the middle of the 17th, 17th century and you can see it completely dominates the landscape. The, the um, palace is here with various other buildings around and the whole of the landscape of the garden is split up into strongly geometric patterns. Now at base that attitude, the attitude that underlies that can be traced back to the first book of, of <coughs> excuse me, the first book of Genesis where God says, go, man shall go forth and dominate the animals and the earth. And this is the king, the absolute king, um, saying, I have been given that power. Now we can't get one picture of the garden of perfect clarity, the Yuan Ming Wen, but this is the entrance. And the rest is composed of many, there's perhaps 50 or 60 different tableaus, different environments in the whole of the, the uh, area. And the area was about twice the size of the Centennial Park, Moor Park complex. Very, very big. And there's one after another of these uh, single story buildings, sometimes double story, sometimes in a few cases three-story buildings put together in a very sympathetic way with hills which are man-made. Everything you see in that picture is man-made. These, these uh, photos, these pictures were, were prepared on the instructions of the emperor who said these are the best 40 views and the best 40 views he had painted on silk and a copy of those paintings is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. 
Um, there were even some French painters, some French and Italian painters, doing in the in the emperor's uh, artistic group. Here is another one. Everything there you see was man-made, but it was ma made to simulate nature and to create a perfect environment so that people could move from one complex like this, this is part of the king, the emperor's own uh, apartments, to another one. So you see how different they are in style to what we saw of the Palace of Versailles. And there were the, um, and on spring festivals such as today and in other um, uh, major festivals, uh, the people and particularly the, the nobility were invited in. Am I on? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, and there were various entertainments and these, these buildings there you see it quite rare, a three-story building. And there were boat shows and dragon boat festivals such as we see. And at these times the uh, emperor gave, uh, did perform uh, important rituals and um, there, was a, there were great celebrations. This is um, a map. Uh, a sketch of the garden. This was where the king's, the emperor's um, envi uh, apartments were and the, and the rest of the, the wives and the consorts. This was a religious area and this was a, a whole inland sea, a sea with here a, a famous place for celebrations and rituals. And at the back, this was a whole collection of rural villages, simulated rural villages, which um, people were allowed to live in and settle in, and uh, it, it, the king could go there as if he didn't have to go outside his front door in order to visit the country. He just went there to visit the country. In fact, the, the imperial gardens were much bigger than this. They also extended over there and over here, just northwest of of Beijing and in um, uh, 1860 uh, during the wars of that time the British and defence forces invaded um, Beijing it's much too long a story it's a fascinating story but it's much too long to go into at the moment but I just put there some extracts from what um, a British officer observed, he said, the variety of the picturesque was endless and charming in the extreme. The resources of the designer appeared to have been unending and no money was spared. All the tasteful landscapes so often viewed in the better class of Chinese landscape paintings were here brought to life. I won't go through the whole thing, but the thing was totally destroyed uh, and everything was taken away in a, a rampage of looting that went on for several days. Now I think the impact of that, I mean it's little known about in the West, but I think the impact of that upon the Chinese sensibility uh, has been much underestimated in the West. And it's interesting that part of that area during the years of the Republic was devoted to the development of Tsinghua University which is one of the intellectual powerhouses of modern China. There are three major types of Chinese gardens. One of the imperial palace gardens, which we've seen, or one of which we've seen, the, the most famous of them. Uh, there are nature reserves such as those around the West Lake at Hongzhou and many other places and there are monasteries where, which are basically open to the public. And then there was the literati garden or the scholar's garden or the gentry garden developed by the, the uh, educated classes and which is still very important in China. Uh, and I've been fortunate to have visited a large number of those. Um, all of the, the principles of all of them are much the same. 
but um, we'll um, uh, be talking mainly about when I get to detail about the about the, the gentry gardens. But the very first imperial gardens were imperial, first classical gardens were imperial gardens, and they go back to perhaps 2,000 years BC. And they were based on high towers, about perhaps about um, uh, 10 to 20 meters high, built so that the king could get up on them and he'd be closer to the gods. By getting up there, he was closer to the gods. And, um, and so could be closer, better, better communication in praying on behalf of the people and in offering, um, making ritual offerings. So even in the Book of Songs, which I just mentioned, which is the first um, anthology in the world, it goes back, uh, it was collected about the 6th century, but it goes back and has elements perhaps as far as 2000 BC. And in that, it says, when he, that is the, the emperor, built the magic tower, all the people worked at it. In less than a day, they built it pretty good. Doe and stag, that is the deers, came coming leapt and bounded. And the white herons gleam, you know, there's a beautiful white heron, gleamed so sleek. The king was by the magic pool, and the fish sprang so lithe. So this was the first description of the imperial garden, which then was, was developed later on. Now, to attempt to um, deal with the Chinese garden in three quarters of an hour or so is an impossible task, so I can't uh, go through it in any uh, detail. But um, as we've seen, the, uh, the elite, the imperial, the gardens kept by uh, dukes and lesser kings go back thousands of years. The first such that we know of was 35 kilometers in circumference. There was, the god was an agrarian god of vegetation, who was god of all nature. And, and uh, although the, the Chinese have never been very particular about how the creation process began, it was there, basically it was there. Um, our architecture was first used as a major element in gardens hundreds of years BC. And, and in a garden, it represents the Confucian values. They're, they're straight lines. I think a bit of wind in the garden is very important. <laughs> and it, the, um, the scholarship and the study and the effort that went in to thinking about gardens uh, became very intense hundreds of years BC, long, long time ago. And important to the, to the development of the garden and the, was the idea that in the mountains were the immortals, lived the immortals. And um, these were these people who'd learned the secret of of uh, eternal life, or at least of long life, and uh, had done this by virtue. So this was a very important thing in the, in the approach, that virtue was the way to uh, achieve uh, an immortal life, well helped out, it was to be hoped, by finding an appropriate liquid that you could drink that would make you uh, live a bit longer. Um, and so, Rocks became very important in gardens, symbolizing the mountains, because the immortals lived in the mountains, in those far away misty mountains. So the, not only the garden, but the thinking about gardens developed very intensively in the years, the century BC and immediately after. But they were very often associated with um, excess, you know, various forms of excess. And it's been said that at the, at the fall of every dynasty could be found in about equal measure the influence of beautiful women and beautiful gardens. And that these brought about or had very much to do with the, with the decline of, uh, of gardens. And perhaps the most famous was the uh, last emperor of the Sui, 
dynasty, Empress Wei Yangde, Yangde who uh, built a, a, a garden which was 75 miles in circumference. The lake in it was about six miles long. It had various other lakes and amazing plants, amazing animals and zoos and had 16 water palaces set at various elements along, sort of staffed with selected concubines and the like. And there were automata, you know, there were things that went uh, boom in the night, you know, the things that uh, uh, like wheel, water wheels and various things like this. In the building of that garden, it is said, it has been reckoned to have been about a million people we were employed, of whom about 50% died. And not surprisingly, it led to a rebellion, and that was the end of that dynasty. Very important in the approach to the garden were the three uh, religions, three ethical systems of China, Taoism, Confucianism, and uh, Buddhism. Again, these are subjects which we can't go into in any detail, but Taoism derives from early Chinese mystical religions and was said to have been founded by Lao Tzu in, in the 6th century BC. But the elements went back much longer and it was very much about living, involved very much about living in uh, harmony with nature and finding a virtuous path. It developed as a religion and came to incorporate various assorted folk beliefs and gods and various, various processes. And it, in particular, uh, involved the search for the immortals. And um, I think we're going to have a, one of the speakers will be talking about uh, Chinese philosophy in relation to gardens and she'll have something to say about that. Confucianism is the system of social and political philosophy or ethics which was developed by an itinerant philosopher generally known in the West as Confucius and uh, contained in the five classics uh, which he, he probably didn't write but uh, said to have been written by him at about, and by other people about that time and where it became the basis of the Chinese moral and ethical system and continued to be so until, until quite modern times and even now is still strongly present in many ways in Chinese society. It stresses the family, the importance of the family and the family as a model for society as a whole and the responsibilities of the father, the patriarch and the hierarchical responsibilities. So it, it led to a form, led to a, a quite highly developed system of political philosophy. And finally, Buddhism, which was founded about the same time as Confucianism by Gautama Buddha in northern India in the 4th or 5th or 6th century BC, um, had its own views about the impermanence of life and how uh, life and liberation could be developed by dependence, uh, by realizing that the world is, is uh, impermanent and, and that it was necessary to follow a ver uh, an ethical path. Again, very much like Confucius, that, that an ethical path was necessary to both the good life and the good society. Um, came to be accepted uh, very much, uh, became very important in the first five or six centuries after of BC, uh, of the common era, that is of our era, fifth and sixth centuries AD, and became, came, at its, uh, came to be at its strongest around about the eighth or ninth century. Um, and uh, by this time it had developed many wealthy monasteries and um, had a very strong influence and became to be very much mixed with both Taoism and Confucianism and they all emphasized the importance of the of humans living in harmony with nature. So this was the general background and within which the various types of gardens developed but in particular and in many ways the most influential were the gentry gardens 
many of which uh, were built uh, in the, for, for historical reasons, in the uh, region of, of southern China, south of the Yangtze, in the Yangtze Delta area, and um, many of which uh, in some form still remain today. Um, the literati had been important in China, uh, and in contrast to, to Western societies, from a long time back. Confucius was an early uh, prototype, so to speak, of, a, of a, a learned scholar going around and teaching and advising kings and, and their governments. It was further in, increased um, the, by the influence of Buddhism in these and later periods, because Buddhism brought with a, a tremendously advanced uh, body of scholarship, particularly in our case, about the arts. And um, the development of the Taoist and Buddhist arts included, in particular, the arts of the garden. And the garden, in this way of viewing things, is a fine art. It's not a, not a decorative art or a practical art. Or a, it's a fine art. So it, obeys the same principles as um, the uh, poetry or landscape or other aesthetic principles. They became very much the literary art of garden were the thing to have. Um, anybody who had uh, official rank uh, and there was virtually no uh, merchant or merchants were very low on the social scale um, the uh, China had the first example of the very advanced bureaucracy and the, the officials and the high officials all competed, so to speak, to have excellent gardens or to have gardens where they could retreat. Um, this was the idea. Uh, they could retreat, uh, meditate, practice their calligraphy, write poetry, but also have parties with their friends. This was a very important element of it. So that in a sense, the, the, uh, a thousand years before the coffee house in Europe, the garden became a sort of a coffee house where people, uh, the elite, particularly the elite men, but also the women of the house could meet. So that's a broad background and I'll, I'll to the, the, uh, where the garden comes from and how it was developed. And I'll just say a few words about um, uh, the design, how the processes which go into and considerations into the design of a garden. First of all, the Chinese gardens that are planted uh, uh, sorry, are uh, built, not planted. Uh, the whole of the site is normally taken up, and this is a good example. There's a wall right around the periphery, and the elements of the garden are composed, disposed within that area. The, it consists of the basic elements are hills, water, trees, and buildings. Um, while the um, buildings are not necessarily the major points or the major notable uh, part elements of the design, they are very often or were very often located first because it was from the building that the view was, was held, was to be found, which was very often based upon a landscape painting or upon a poem or, or upon both. So although the, the, um, the, the um, design was started off by saying where are the buildings going to go, uh, the rest was built in around it to make a whole, make a whole complex in which the major views were to be had from the building that, you know, from each of the buildings. Um, the, there are trees, shrubs, water, rocks, buildings and hard landscaping like like what we see outside, the paving. Flowers and flower beds are used and are quite important, but they are not, uh, they are not a major, and not unlike uh, Western gardens, they're not a major element in the design. 
um, lawns in the west evoke meadows, you know, sweetness and light and lambs and nice things in the, in the Arcadian past. But for Chinese, they, they used to suggest anyway the grassy, dangerous steppes of the barbarians. As one Chinese scholar visiting England in the 1920s said, grass lawns are no doubt pleasing to a cow, but could hardly engage the intellect of an, the, hardly engage an intellectual mind. Rocks, often of strange shapes, and are much prized and very expensive, representing the mysterious worlds of the mountains, and hence of the immortals, are very important. And we'll see uh, later how they are used. And of course they're familiar, the idea is familiar because of the very many dramatic mountainscapes, in, uh, not on the coast particularly, but further inland. So the starting points are, mankind is embedded in nature, is active but not dominant. Aim of living in harmony with nature. Necessary to learn the inner expression of the meaning of nature, this is the Taoist element. Garden arts are fine arts, along with painting and poetry. Whereas a poem conceives a painting, a painting suggests a poem, Su Xu, who is one of the great poets, Su Dong Po, and both of those things can be said about the garden. A garden is very often was based upon a poem or a, or a uh, painting. The, the basic elements are what we've already described, and the halls, pavilions, bridges, etc., are essential elements in the whole thing. So that the whole thing is a home which is a residence within a garden. It's not a residence plus a garden. And the whole thing is composed, is, as I said, in one. It's, as I, I'll be talking a little bit about this garden, uh, this garden is not a residential garden, and so it's been very cleverly adapted, the principles have been very cleverly adapted to give us the elements. But it, if this were a, a true classical garden, the arrangement of the buildings would be quite different. And a very important aspect, whereas in, in Western, inclu including in Australia, the, there is the outdoors and the indoors. What's, be, what's outdoors and indoors are, are different, though in more recent times, in the last 40, 50 years, I suppose, there's been a stronger a push to bridge the two. That idea is quite foreign in, in the Chinese garden. The outside, and you can see numerous examples if you go into the buildings here, the outside comes inside, and the inside, so to speak, goes outside. It's welcomed in, so that the impact is quite different. And very importantly, the design should give continuously varied sights and insights, looking into things and wondering what's there. So there are a number of specific um, principles. First of all is the directional orientation. Secondly, there's the setting off of the real and the false. Thirdly, there's the setting off of the small against the large, uh, or the close against the distant. The ass assembling and piling up uneven and neat, connecting and separating, open and closed, level and solid, proportion and distance, exposing and concealing. And so if we look at it, we can sum it up in two words. One is balance, there are a balance of the elements within the garden, and the second is uncertainty and surprise. Uncertainty surprised that where you're going, what's happening next, where am I? There's a, a big sense of uh, leading on. Just very quickly, the garden is close to the home. It's small, it's walled. There are small individual pa patterns leading onto another one. And the whole idea of the, of the English picturesque garden, for example, and the idea of rooms in the garden came originally from the Chinese garden. The um, various elements of, 
uh, water and trees and plants and sculpture. And in particular, particularly in this garden, um, borrowed, borrowed scenery. Uh, the, it's not just the garden you look at, it's, the, it's what's around it that's important, or can be important. So I'll just give you a few elements here. This is the, you've probably all seen this map. It's the map of this garden. And um, this is the hill up there. And, that, and we're around here somewhere. And this is the, and just very quickly, you can see that, the gar that nothing of this happened um, except, I'm sure, with a great deal of thought. I haven't met the, the garden designers, but uh, we, can, we can see some of their ideas. That's the east, over there, over there. So, this, when the sun co comes up, it comes across the garden. It comes across like this, so there's a constantly changing uh, vi pattern of shadows and light and shadows and what can be seen and what can't be seen. Similarly, the uh, moon comes the same way, and I haven't been here at night, but I'm sure this is a fantastic place for moonlight nights. Uh, the water here would be illuminated by the moon, and there'd be a constantly changing, gently changing pattern as you come across this, this direction. So the directional orientation in a, in a Chinese garden, and certainly in the north of China, this is a, a, a garden from Guangzhou, which was designed uh, by um, people from, garden designers uh, from, from uh, Guangzhou. And uh, I'm not so familiar with their patterns of gardens, but in the, in the north, uh, the garden, the major buildings typically face south, so, so that the light from the sun uh, is much, uh, much easier, more easily seen. Then in this, we have this from down here, we can look up there, and you see the, the, the mountain, that's about, I'd guess, that's about 12 metres, uh, but the building is probably another 12 metres, and you can see how it stands, sets really marks but looks at us very in a very stark way, very dramatic way. And what's behind it? Modern buildings. So the first thing that you'll see in this garden is that the modern buildings are in a sense welcomed in. You know, they're they're shown as being part of this garden is part of the city, but at the same time they're shown as being separate. So that the so that the garden uh, is seen as an enclosure, as um, a place of, of refuge, so to speak, from the city as a whole. Again, that, we see the difference between piling up and spreading. We have spreading down here, and again the piling up to that hill. The, the mountain here has been used with very great effect. That's the mountain up there, of course. Exposing and concealing. Again, we have the same. The, the, uh, we can see uh, various elements as we go, and when we go to some parts, we can't see others. And, and then you think, well, where's that? I just glimpsed that when I was walking around that corner. Where is it? So you're led on to see, well, where am I? There's a constant sense of mystery. Connecting and separating. This obviously, this is just up there. We've got a connection going through here, but there's something else off there, which is cut off by that um, part of the wall there. And over here, we've got these trees, but you can't see up through there very well, and the wall is cutting it off anyway, so it's, so it's difficult to see where you are. Uh, but there is a connection by the path, nice path, but there's also a separation. You're not quite clear where you're going to go after this. Uneven and neat, this is uh, the entrance when you, when you come through the front. Um, you've got the penjing, the, uh, what we call bonsai, out here, which is a very fine collection of bonsai. 
which, but they're also rather untidy, you know, they're in various shapes and odd things, but it's put in an area which is strictly confined by this plain wall, and if you've got very well marked uh, a paving around there, so that the pattern of that is, is brought out for you. This you'll see, you'll see, I'm just giving the, I could discuss various other elements of design on that particular one, but you'll see how as you go around, the uneven is constantly pushed off, um, marked off against the neat, and, and uh, there's a sort of a variety going on the whole time. Again, this is exposing and concealing. These, this leads you up there. There's a path leading to the right up here. And there's a path leading out this way, and there's another one up there. But you can't see them. You get, they're only hinted at. You can see that there's something there. But you can't see it the way you can, in a, even in an English garden, very often. Uh, one of mean an English country garden. Um, you can very often see the whole garden. You can never see the whole garden in a Chinese garden. You can never see the whole garden. And proportion and distance is, of course, very important. And we see how the proportion of this, this very elegant shape here, is put on that very uh, strong horizontal uh, shelf, the platform, and so it's brought out, but it's also framed by these two pillars, which, as you look there, it focuses your attention onto there, but it also tends to give it, make it appear to be further away than you think it is. There's plenty of examples of this, of course, the level and the solid, but in this case, here is a zigzag bridge. It's said that zigs is, uh, Bridges are zigzag, and there's a very fine one there, and you very often see zigzag bridges, is because the devils, the evil spirits, travel in straight lines. And so by putting zigzags into them, they can't get there very, they've got to keep stopping. And so that's uh, supposed to be the importance of the zigzag, which is quite level. And it's marked off by this very solid rock here, which sets up a contrast with these shapes. Sorry. Uh, this is inside and outside. In this case, um, the designers have, have actually brought the inside right inside because they planted um, these banana trees, which of course grow very well here, inside a little bay within, within it. But you can see that there's a window here, and there are more windows here, and the outside is flowing in to the inside. There are always places in the garden to view the, the garden from. Uh, and this pavilion, which is just up there, is a notable, notable place for you to stop. It's very important if you can possibly do it in a Chinese garden, is not to be in a rush. It's a place for wandering through and sitting in. And, and um, if in China, you know, groups of people take their thermoses of tea and their, their drawing blocks or whatever. And you can go there for hours, and that's that's what you do. That's what the garden's for. It's not just for a view; it's for relishing. So this is a pavilion where you can do that, and you can see there's an entrance going here, but you're not quite sure what sort of an entrance it is. But that's the sort of entrance it is, and you can see how how dramatic that is when you come there and you're going to walk up those steps but you're confronted by these, these magnificent rocks and stones stones here which they really make you feel that you've got a task to do to go up those rather simple steps to the pavilion which is just in the top right hand corner and the fav favorite device of the moon garden the moon gate uh, again we can you've got uh, several choices to make whether you go out through there, whether you can uh, come down here and go out through this way, and indeed when you get there there are a couple of more ways to go, uh, each of which gives you options, which, which way I'm going to go. And that's a view backwards, 
So through the moon garden, the moon gate, uh, and you can see this long vista across the water, and it seems a long way away. Now, this, this uh, site is about uh, one hectare, I believe. That's about two and a half acres. But I think you'll agree, even after a short walk around it, that it seems to be much bigger than that. The, set, the space has been manipulated in such a way that you can think that you're in a mountain paradise, really. And here's another place up there where you can sit and chat and have a look around at what's going on. And the waterfall, beautiful use of water on both, both sides. Who'd think that you're in the middle of Sydney, you know, when, you're, when you've got that to go up to? And as you go up there, or up here, you've got a couple of ways to go, towards that pavilion, which is over there. Oh, and you pass the tree, there's always a bit of life. There's the carp in the, in the pond over a nice little bridge. And you walk up to the top, when you get up to the top, and again, whether you're going to go this way or you're going to go this way, and there's the pavilion you're looking for. I, I just mentioned that there are some concessions made to local taste in this garden. For example, you see a bit of lawn over there. Uh, you, you wouldn't see that in... Um, in a Chinese garden, and these uh, shrubs wouldn't be trimmed in a Chinese garden, trimmed into topiary, uh, but that's to make it a bit easier for us, you know. And here's the pavilion at the top there. So you can sit there for a while, and then move on, and there's the pagoda. It's a very fine building, which is at the top, and when you um, go into the look, come around and look down there, you look down, and this is a, a very good example of, of the effects of, of manipulating distance. These two trees here, like those two pillars I mentioned before, they frame that view. And this appears to be much further away. When you're up here and looking down, this whole uh, foreground here appears to be much further away than you, than you think. Well, I'm being given signals. Uh, it's, well, I've got you to the top. I'll have to stop. I've got you to the top. You'll have to get your own way down. But on your way down, on your way down, you'll find that, or you might find, that this is one of the only gardens in the world, Chinese gardens in the world, which has its own dragons. And there, there's a dragon. There. They're all waiting for you. And you can, the stones, you'll find a collection of stones over there which take the place of a sculpture, which take the place of a sculpture garden, the way the, they're arranged. But in Chinese gardens, you very rarely see an individual sculpture. And that's, I just took that, that's the beginning, that's the entrance. Who would imagine outside that what we've just seen was there behind it? It's a, it's a great, great feat. Now, I could go on for some time, but I'm not. But thank you very much. And uh, if I have any questions, or any quick, a quick question. Oh, you're overwhelmed. Yeah, you, 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 it's, it's not that you haven't got questions. All right, well, thank you. Right. A very different sense of vista, isn't it? There's no perspective in this no, at no. all. So there's no point of view. There's no point of view. Yes. That's right. Multiple points of view. And of and the they're constantly changing uh, vistas. It's very very clever. I can't claim to be able to do it myself, but I, it's the way it's, it's. And when you go up there and walk around, you'll see what I'm ta we're talking about. Okay. Thank you.